All right. All right, great. So <coughs> welcome everyone, we are friends, to a very special gathering. Uh, Rudolf Steiner Branch in Chicago is where I am at, and I am Mary Spaulding, and I'm the president of the Rudolf Steiner Branch, currently serving um, in Chicago right now. And um, I want to um, just say that we're very excited to be partnering with our neighboring Great Lakes Branch in Ann Arbor to host our dear friend and colleague, Mary Stewart Adams who will be speaking about to be festival gathering in celebration of St. John's 2023. Um, so Mary is a star lore historian and the host of the weekly public radio podcast, The Storyteller's Night Sky. In 2011, she established one of the world's first international dark sky parks. And in 2021, she published the book, The Star Tales of Mother Goose. Mary met the work of Rudolf Steiner simultaneous to encountering ancient star wisdom in the 1980s, which was galvanized into a life path through encounter with astrosopher Hazel Straker in 1995. Mary is currently serving on the General Council of the Anthroposophical Society of America and as a board member of the Great Lakes Branch. So I want to warmly welcome Mary Stewart Adams. And before I ask her to start speaking, I also want to introduce over here, my uh, dear son and colleague, Lucien Dante Lazar, who is an artist and a musician and uh, is currently pursuing his PhD from the California Institute of Integral Studies and about to embark um, on Eurythmy training while he is writing his dissertation in the fall. So um, warm welcome to Lucien, who's gonna be working artistically with all of you. And uh, now I think we're all ready to say hello and welcome to Mary. Okay, thank you, Mary. Thank you to the Great Lakes, uh, the, the Chicago branch and to the Great Lakes branch and to um, all those who are joining us to celebrate Part of the reason we wanted to do this together is because of where we find ourselves geographically, which is along the shores of the world's largest surface area of fresh water. But before I go any further, I want to, um, Lucien had asked me to share with everyone that we will do an artistic exercise and you, are, you will be invited to go get a piece of paper and some pencils or pastels. Hopefully you have something at hand. Um, I'll probably speak for about 45 minutes and then I'll hand it over to Lucien for this exercise. Then we'll come back to me for some closing thoughts. And I will share that in part, I would really like for this to be a conversation, but that will require it of me that I either go very quickly or I eliminate most of what I was going to share. So we'll just see how I can do because if you have come to a Zoom presentation with me before, you know that I err on the side of too much information. And this particular festival has so many beautiful avenues and opportunity for consideration that it was challenging work to decide which route I was going to take. But I think you'll, you'll find, hopefully you'll find it interesting. And I just wanna point out that tomorrow, Wednesday, June 21st is officially the summer solstice. And that from summer solstice on June 21st until the feast of St. John on June 24th, we are entering what could be described as a sacred border zone. So we're in this space that's kind of, uh, it could also be described as a liminal space. It's not, we're not in this place of necessarily recalling where we have been, nor yet beholding where we will go, but just sensing, where am I right now? And this kind of sensing at this time of year is akin to waking up into a dream, not out of it. So this is a spiritual practice, trying to become cognizant before you awaken. And so I think this is the mood that we have at this time of year. And it's important to kind of have that sense as we go through what I'm going to describe. Um, because from here, at this point in the cycle of the year, it's as though we were held aloft from the earth and reading the pictures of the earth. It's kind of showing it to us, to us, not so much, I'm going to talk about the star picture, but really it's about what is the earth 
in relationship to the stars right now? And what have we received in our inner life through the festival cycle, particularly since Christmas? So from Christmas to, to St. John's, it's really about nourishing the inner life. And so we come to this moment of pause and have this sense of what have I received? And then that can be as though fashioned as an offering to the celestial spiritual world. And I'm offering something up out of, out of my inner life. And then I receive this fructification from the celestial spiritual world. And that gives me the capacity ideally from St. John's back to Christmas to begin to make an answer. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit more. I realized I'd wanted to say all that while I was sharing my screen, um, but I'll just have to, okay. So is everybody seeing that, Mary? If you could give me a thumbs up about you seeing my screen. Yes, okay, good. So this was a picture that I took looking west over Lake Michigan at summer solstice two years ago. I liked it because it's got the water and the fiery sun. And so this is uh, this moment of solstice, which solstice literally means the standing still of the sun. And so it looks to us on the earth that the sun is moving around us, but it's actually that moment of solstice is a description of how there seems to be a pause where the sun gets to the place in the Northern hemisphere in our summer when it's the furthest north along the horizon at its rising and its setting. And it will seem to rise and set somewhat close to where it is for a couple of days, and then it will begin to move south again. And so we are approaching that moment. Tomorrow, June 21st, the sun will make its northernmost sunset. Okay. So I wanted to start with looking at what's going to be happening in the sky this week, because the picture is really spectacular. Um, if you're looking west an hour after sunset, Tonight, you should be, begin to just see the crescent moon. The moon was new on Saturday, uh, excuse, yeah, overnight Saturday to Sunday. And then tomorrow night, Wednesday, the 21st, the moon will be really spectacular next to Venus. Then it's going to move on June 22nd. It will have passed by Mars approaching Regulus at the heart of the lion. We get to June 23rd, which is the eve of St. John's. And then we come to St. John's time. So this will be a beautiful image to be looking at in the West. After sunset, this image comes from Sky and Telescope magazine. But just to share that I'm going to give you times in the Eastern time zone, because that's where I am. So summer solstice, the exact moment is tomorrow, Wednesday, June 21st at 1057 AM. And actually solstice is a, a, a series, a, a, a sequence of days. It's not exactly just that moment. It's about three days. It's that pause in our breathing our out breath. Rudolf Steiner describes how the earth isn't breathing air, it's actually breathing forces out into the cosmos at this time of year. And then there's a slight pause before the in breath begins again. And so during this time of the pause, what I would be looking for is how can I enter into that if I'm trying to engage with the earth sun or earth moon, earth planet, earth star relationship. So I look for things like what time is the sun going to rise on the solstice? This is the longest day of the year. The sun is northernmost. In the Eastern time zone, sunrise tomorrow morning will be at 5.51 a.m. So you'll remember from the description of this program that what I'm looking at is how do we become festival creating? And this is something that Rudolf Steiner spoke about in the Easter lectures that he gave in 1923 about, uh, about our becoming festival creating. Um, this is a series of lectures called The Cycle of the Year as a Breathing Process of the Earth. And it's really about trying to live with the being of the year and to do the esoteric. So I ask myself, how do I do that? Particularly if I'm not close to a Waldorf community where there might be um, festivals celebrated through the schools, or I'm not participating in a Christian community where there's a, or any kind of a, a religious institution that might be observing festivals. I am an anthroposophist in the world. I have this kind of exhortation from Rudolf Steiner to be festival creating. What do I do? So what I do as a person who is studying the stars, I'm looking to the stars. Okay, what is the moment that might um, be ideal for beginning to do something? So I look to, okay, sunrise on summer solstice. Then when is the solstice moment? So we've got su sunrise in my time zone again, 5.51 a.m. You can find sunrise time pretty, pretty easily in your own time zone. Sunset will be at 9.32 p.m. So these are two points when I might do something. Then also, because the moon is a beautiful crescent, I want to know what is moon doing? So tomorrow evening, 
when, uh, summer solstice, the moon is not going to set in my time zone till just after midnight. So moon and Venus are going to go all the way through the twilight and then set in the midnight hour. Just, it's just so much mystery and magic in that. And then we get to the Feast of St. John three days later on the 24th. So I just want to point out, so what I'm looking at is the moment of solstice, sunrise time, sunset time, what is the moon doing? And is there a way during this pause where I'm not in, this, in, in a mood of spirit recalling or spirit beholding, but in this spirit sensing, while the earth is breathing out, there is this description from Rudolf Steiner as though we, we, we go to sleep at this time. Can I sense in that dreamlike state, what is it that I am offering and that can be met by the spiritual world? So again, Tomorrow night, we have moon and Venus, then the 22nd, moon and Mars, and then the 23rd, moon and Regulus. So I just think it's really lovely to have this kind of contemplation of what's happening in the night sky to inform my activity. But also, I want to look a bit at how do we get to the festival of St. John, and how do we get to it being placed where it is in the calendar? Because it's not happenstance that it happens on June 24th, which is exactly six months ahead of Christmas Eve. So this is the Annunciation to Zacharias that was painted by Del Conte in the 1500s. And so what's happening in the story, at least as it's recorded in the Luke gospel, is that it's the time of incense and Zacharias is doing the ceremony in the temple and the archangel Gabriel appears to him and says to him that his wife Elizabeth is going to have a son and that he tells him, you shall call the child John. And so this is the beginning of a process that is quite beautiful with regard to the mystery. If we go back, um, it's interesting, Adam Biddleston points out in his uh, it, uh, cycle of lectures about the festival cycle of the year, that most feast days of the saints in the calendar are to commemorate the death of a saint. But several feast days and festival days are actually rooted in something like an annunciation from an angel or in the case of St. John and in the Christ child, it's their birth. So the feast of St. John is actually about his birth. So if he's born on June 24th, then this annunciation to Zacharias is happening in September. Right, so we have this nine month process where an angel has announced to Zacharias that his wife who was older and barren is going to bear a child. That child shall be named John and thou shalt, reading from the King James Version, and thou shalt have joy and gladness and many shall rejoice at his birth for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. So this is an important detail to hang on to, and I'm sure we're all familiar with this story of the Annunciation of John to Zacharias. Six months later, the Archangel Gabriel appears to Mary. So now Elizabeth is in her sixth month of pregnancy, and, and Mary receives this Annunciation. This is Leonardo's famous painting of the Annunciation to Mary. And what I love about this image is that looking at Gabriel carrying the lily, which is this symbol of a communication from the divine to the human world. He also paints a shadow with the Archangel Gabriel, which to me seems to suggest that he's actually manifesting in the physical world. So with Mary, Gabriel announces that it's, as it's written in the, in the Luke gospel, in the sixth month, the, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named, Z named Z Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And so Gabriel tells her that she shouldn't be afraid about what's happening, that she's found favor with God, and also that even her cousin Elizabeth is expecting a child. So this is really important in this moment. Gabriel has announced to Zacharias that his wife will bear John. Then six months later, he announces to Mary that she will bear the Christ child, She's given a choice. She has to choose to accept this enunciation. And she does say in, this, uh, in these few verses here from the Luke gospel, she says, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. So this is Mary accepting this enunciation from Gabriel. And then it goes on to describe how it came to pass that when Elizabeth, so that, that Mary in those days, she arose 
and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. So Mary's in Nazareth. She gets this annunciation from Gabriel. She immediately makes a journey to her cousin Elizabeth. So at this point in the story, Elizabeth is already six months pregnant. Mary is at the beginning of her pregnancy. And so the two of them come together. And at the moment that Mary enters into the home and Elizabeth, who's six months pregnant, finds herself in the presence of Mary, who's carrying the Christ child. She's filled with the Holy Ghost. She speaks out with a loud voice and says, blessed art thou among women, women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So you hear this in the, the Hail Mary prayer that uh, comes, at least as I know it, through the Catholic Church. But it's really interesting, this period of time then, that Mary and Elizabeth spend together. It's about 12 weeks that marks the last trimester of Elizabeth's pregnancy. It's the first 12 weeks of Mary's pregnancy. And Mary has traveled to Elizabeth to spend this time together. But then what's very interesting, this is the image as it was painted by Raphael, there's a lot of really beautiful mystery happening in this image, including the fact that over in the background, you can see a future deed that will be coming when these two children are born. Now, Mary looks quite pregnant in this picture. So this is Mary on the right, and this is Elizabeth on the left. If this picture was painted by Raphael to depict the moment that Mary arrives at the home of Elizabeth, she's only just pregnant. So she wouldn't necessarily be showing right away but this could have been at the end of her visitation, at which point she was three months pregnant. But I think it's also quite interesting that in the Luke gospel, it describes that Mary stays with Elizabeth for about three months, and then she returns to her own house. This is Luke chapter one, verse 56. But she leaves before John is born. She doesn't stay for the birth of John. Then in verse 57, it goes on to say, now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered and she brought forth a son. All right, so the Annunciation to Zacharias is happening in, in September. Nine months later, at the end of June, John is born. The Annunciation to Mary happens in March. Nine months later, the Christ child is born. Mary and Elizabeth spend about 12 weeks together at the beginning of Mary's pregnancy and at the end of Elizabeth's pregnancy, but they're not together when the births take place. So Annunciation to Zacharias in September, Annunciation to Mary, March 25th, then the Feast of the Visitation, which is placed in the calendar as the point in the cycle of the year when you celebrate Mary and Elizabeth coming together is about three months after the Annunciation. So it's this 12 weeks that Mary and Elizabeth spend together. 33 years later, that 12 weeks is exactly the time that it takes to get from the raising of Lazarus, which is celebrated in the Orthodox Church on the Saturday before Holy Week until the Feast of St. John. So this period of time that these two women come together, one in the first trimester of her pregnancy, the other in the last trimester of her pregnancy, they spend that time together 33 years later, this will be the same period of time in the cycle of the year where the great mystery of Golgotha will take place from the raising of Lazarus through the crucifixion, the resurrection, the 40 days of teaching until the Annunciation, then we have the Pentecost, and then St. John's. So I think of this as a really remarkable background for trying to understand what is the mystery of this festival of John and how can we understand the role of the feminine in particular in kind of creating a place for holding what is to come. And in thinking about what is the appropriate mood for entering into this season. So the human being together with earth forces has as though breathed all the way out into the cosmos at the time of summer solstice to St. John's. We're in this mood of kind of spirit sensing. And it's as though something is being offered out of what we've been given in the, the spiritual cycle of the year from Christmas time is informing something that we would offer to the spiritual cosmos ideally as though it were a chalice. So offering something up, but it's also something into which we can receive the fructifying forces that will then, you could say, kind of 
activate what we have offered and give us the capacities now to answer. So I think of Elizabeth and Mary in this respect, not just as pregnant women, but as human beings that have become chalice for the divine. And so this I think of as a mood for how do we approach this mystery of this time in the cycle of the year. And then also pointing out that they are a chalice potentially for different elements. So Elizabeth will bear the John child who becomes John the Baptist, the one who baptizes with water. Mary will bear the Christ child about whom John says, while I'm baptizing with water, there is one to come who will baptize with the Holy Ghost, or you could say with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And so in their coming together, there is potentially this union of these elements of water and fire. And this also, I think, lives in the mystery of this particular festival. So I was sharing with Gordon from the Chicago community who's online with us. He gifted me a book. Gordon, I think it was your father-in-law. Um, but so a beautiful, beautiful book by Theodore Schwenk about water, the element of life, in which he describes this quote does not do justice to the poetry and the poetic description of water and how it takes nothing. Uh, it doesn't take form onto itself, but that it gives everything to, to that which would have what we would describe as life biologically, be it the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the human kingdom, none of it can survive without water. And that water has to completely surrender itself in order that that may happen in freedom. And given this nature of water, it is, you could say, the, the uh, highest expression, the highest elemental expression of wisdom. So I'll just read this quote from Theodore Schwenk. Since water is universal and a stranger to one-sidedness, it is the means whereby the full range of life is made possible. Hence, it is truly the waters of life. The concept water might best be expressed as universality through renunciation. So it renounces itself so that everything else can become. Just as John says, and I've inserted this here, he must increase, referring to the Christ being, I must decrease. This is a renunciation of the self. This is a gesture of the water, wisdom's element. Because of the wisdom that makes it what it is, it is fitted to be the carrier of cosmic forces. So just to hold this idea that John and potentially Elizabeth, as she stands in this stream of becoming with the Baptist, that it would be celebrated at the Feast of St. John on, Jan on June 24th, when we're in this mood of offering something to the cosmos, it has this quality of the, the element of wisdom that is fully renouncing itself so that something may become. And then, again, from another text, which I am not at all doing justice to by just quoting this small piece, this is a foreword that Marie Steiner wrote to the Eurythmy course when it was published in 1927. And she's talking about, well, she's talking about the word. Um, it's, I really, it's a beautiful, beautiful foreword. When the word desires to turn towards men, it speaks of choice through the flame. The element of flame is identical to its own being. So I put these two quotes beside this image because I have this sense that Elizabeth is in bearing John, who is the Baptist with the water, Mary, who is bearing the Christ child, who will be the one that baptizes with the fires of the Holy Spirit, that this element of water and fire in their union, particularly these three, these three months when they come together at the end of March all the way until the end of June, that there is this commingling of this water fiery element that belongs to our becoming. And then we have in the, and, and also that John, John in saying that there is one who comes after me who was before me, I come baptizing with water, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. 
He also begins the John Gospel with the words, in the beginning was the word. And as Marie Steiner is saying, the, the element of choice of the word is fire. So we have the Baptist pointing at the fire. And then in the John Gospel, this saying by the Christ being to Nicodemus, when he has said that a human being must be born again, and Nicodemus asks this question, must a, how can a human being enter a second time into his mother's womb? And the Christ being responds by saying, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So I'm drawing so much emphasis or placing so much emphasis on this because just one octave, eight days after the Feast of St. John, we have the Feast of the Visitation, which is celebrating this moment, this coming together of Mary and Elizabeth, who are as both of them chalices, one for this watery element, the other for the fiery element, kind of commingling at this time in the cycle of the year, one bearing wisdom, the other bearing the word, and I think that these are beautiful imaginations. It's not necessarily something that you have to understand intellectually, but just to have as a picture and as a sense, what is water? What is fire? How does that relate to wisdom and to flame and to, and to the word? And to be carrying that as we're trying to wake into the summer dream. And so moving on from this, and I'm hoping that this will stir some questions um, and that there will be time for us to get to that at the end. But I also would like to point out that from this time of St. John's through the summer months, where we're still kind of in this summer dream, even though the sun is coming back south along the horizon as it's setting, we're kind of moving through that dream, a process is taking place where you could imagine that we've become, whether male or female, pregnant in the cycle of the year with what is to come. And so having taken what was given to us to support the inner life and offering it up at St. John as though in this gesture of the chalice and receiving fructification from the divine spiritual world, something begins to grow and develop in the human being. And we can find this expressed in the feast days that you, not every single feast day, I didn't pick every single one, but several of the feast days moving through the summer months and particularly how they were articulated or pointed to by Rudolf Steiner through the calendar of the soul. So verse 13 is in the original calendar of the soul, the verse that corresponded to the time uh, that included the date July 2nd, which is the feast of the visitation. And when I live in senses heights, so we've got the senses heights, we breathe out into the heights, there flames up deep within my soul, out of the spirit's fiery worlds, the God's own word of truth in spirit sources seek expectantly to find your spirit kinship. We will oftentimes, at least in American culture, speak about a woman who is having a child that she is expecting. And so this, I think, is a direct reference, at least in translation by Hans Pusch, to this encounter between Mary and Elizabeth. They are kindred spirits, they are cousins, and that this is something that in the, Mac, they, they, they would represent kind of this archetypal human at this time of year, and that it's the right gesture to expect to find that kind of spirit kinship at this time of year. And that it is, uh, you don't wanna lapse into cliche, but there's something, it, it, it's, it's pregnant with potential at that moment. And then moving on, several verses to verse 16, to bear in inward keeping spirit bounty. So I've received this spirit bounty into this chalice that I've offered up, and now it's starting to stream toward me on the in-breath. I'm starting to bear it into myself, not all the way. So I imagine it as though it's still like aloft, descending from the with the sun, from the sun, on the rays of the sun toward me. It's not all the way fully embodied in my being yet. It's kind of a sense and a mood that I have. I'm still drawn out into the outer world. But now just beginning to bear in inward keeping spirit bounty is stern command of my prophetic feeling that ripened gifts divine, maturing in the depths of soul to selfhood bring their fruits. So this verse first appeared in the calendar of the soul in the week that corresponds to when we have the feast of the Magdalene. 
which I think has, she has this gesture, she has to bear in inward keeping. She's the first one to witness the Christ at the resurrection. And he says to her, don't touch me. I am not yet risen to my father. Go tell, go tell the others that you have seen me. But she has to bear something. This is, a, you could say she has come upon spirit bounty, finding the risen one, but she has to hold it within herself. She can't, she can't reach out to him. She has to bear this within herself. And then also Anna, who is the mother of Mary, there's no description of her conception of Mary, but the Immaculate Conception of Mary is celebrated in December. But she has also to mature within her being, something that is coming to birth. So we find this happening. So we've got the, the birth of John celebrated at the Feast of St. John's. Then we have the celebration of the Feast of the Annunciation and this reference now to, to these feminine that have to kind of hold within themselves. It's not yet time to give birth. Then we get to verse 17, which corresponds to the week when we have the festival of Martha, who is the sister of Lazarus, to whom the Christ being says, thy brother shall rise again. In this verse, we have thus speaks the cosmic word, the Christ being speaking to Martha, there will be another life. Unless thou is born of the water and of the spirit. This is pointing at that second becoming, you could say, that is quickened by the flame of the word. And then when we get to verse 18, I refer to this as the transfiguration verse, because this corresponds to the week of when we have the date of August 6th, which is celebrated in the calendar, the feast of the transfiguration. And we find here specific words, at least as the German is translated by Hans Pusch, can I expand my soul that it unites itself with cosmic word, which I have received as a seed. It's coming toward me. You could say it's, there's this, this vast expanse of the spirit with this big out breath. It's coming toward me, but it's also coming. It's, it's gradually condensing into the form of a seed that I will bear within my own being. I sense that I must find the strength to fashion worthily my soul as fitting raiment for the spirit which lifts right out of the Luke gospel where he describes the transfiguration in chapter nine. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. So we have this direct relationship to, to what becomes of the human being that has developed the capacity to bear this fructified seed of the spiritual cosmos. You could just say into the cycle of the year. It's something that we need to nourish our becoming. And as human beings on the earth, the earth asks it of us. Because from St. John's toward Christmas, we are now bearing earthward what the cosmos would say. From Christmas back to St. John's, we are bearing toward the cosmos what earth would say. Rudolf Steiner describes that the, the, the way to understand the human being is to look at the rhythm that passes between the earth and the heavens find the rhythm that speaks between them and ask this question, when would earth know about the heavens and when would the heavens know about the earth? So at the time of St. John's, we are offering, you could say, earth toward the heavens. And then from St. John's back to Christmas, we are offering them that heavenly fructification to the earth. So this process of becoming from St. John's all the way through to the middle of August, you could say, we get all the way to verse 19, in secret to encompass now with memory what I've newly got. Now it is in my being. This shall be my strivings further aim. Thus ever strengthening selfhood's forces shall be awakened from within and growing, give myself to me. So by the time we get about five to six weeks away from St. John's, now it is in my own being. So we're at the middle of August. The sun is approaching the sign of Virgo. This is the region of the pregnant virgin. And I think of these few weeks, these five or six weeks from St. John's to the middle of August as the organogenesis, which is a term that comes from embryology when in the first few weeks of a pregnancy, what happens in the human, in the, the human embryo is the development or the, the layered development in the cellular structure of the embryo into three different layers. And these will serve the becoming of the organs that will be in the physical body. 
So these three layers are described, and I'm not an embryologist, but I've been contemplating this for a lot of years and thinking about the threefold nature and trying to understand what is this layering and what consequence does it have in our becoming. So in the gastrulation, gastrulation there are these three layers described, the endoderm, which is the layer from which the respiratory system will develop, the ectoderm, from which the nervous system will develop, and then the mesoderm, which gives us the circulatory system. So during these weeks, from St. John's to the middle of August, if we imagine this as a time that is alike to the first few weeks of a human pregnancy, and what's happening with the embryo, something is beginning to develop. And you could say that it's developing out of this spirit sensing. I have an idea, I'm offering something to the cosmos, the cosmos answers back. I'm still in a dream, not potentially, not yet awake to the spirit recalling or to the spirit beholding. I'm still in this state of spirit sensing. And I really think that that shows up in this organ, the description of the ag as, excuse me, the organogenesis because of how you have the first beginnings of the respiratory system and the circulatory system the heart and the lung, which for me points to the second panel of the foundation stone meditation, human soul. You live within the beat of heart and lung, which bears you through the rhythms of time into the feeling of your own soul being, practice, spirit, sensing. So I really think that this is um, potentially an overriding seasonal mood, that spirit sensing in the breathing in the rhythm of heart and lung, in this sense that we've breathed out into cosmos, we will breathe in. You could say that that applies to the entire cycle of the year, but at this period of time, we're not all pregnant, we're not all develop, having a, a, an embryo developing within us, but we are pregnant with our own becoming. And the organs you could say that we are developing could be described as organs of perception. And that the first indication that this is happening is coming around the middle of August when there can be the first awakenings of conscience. But before we get there, I just want to share this beautiful image that was painted by my dear friend, Pamela Sophia John, which she titled, Within the Beat of Heart and Lung. And this image is going to be used in a forthcoming publication at the Gartianum to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Christmas conference where they will publish the foundation stone meditation in the different languages of the world. And they solicited artwork from people around the world for this publication and Pamela's piece was chosen. And so I asked her permission to share it because it speaks to this uh, within the rhythm of heart, within the beat of heart and lung, which I find uniquely related to this period of time that we are just about entering into. We get to the solstice moment tomorrow, moving through St. John's, through the visitation, through the several weeks of the summer, coming to this moment in the middle of August where now there's a sense, an organ of perception is potentially there, conscience is beginning to awaken, now would begin the spirit beholding. I'm not gonna go any further than that with that imagination. I wanna pay attention to the time because Lucienne is going to take us through an artistic activity. This is going to be my last slide, Lucienne, before I uh, hand it over to you. So I just want to point out that this chalice of the moon is what we're going to see both tonight, tomorrow night, and throughout this week. This is the waxing crescent moon. And so it also has this gesture as of a chalice. And as I showed in the earlier image, that chalice is going to move right past Venus, then past Mars, then par past the heart of the lion on its way to St. John's. So we really have this really beautiful gesture happening in the evening sky. And when I think about what might that mean? What does it mean when moon is with Venus, then with Mars, then with the heart star? This doesn't happen every year. The moon is not always gonna be at that phase. It's not gonna be in that region of the sky. Those planets won't necessarily be there. And if I just take it superficially, Venus as goddess of love and beauty, Mars as action and activity, Regulus as the star that bears the forces of the heart, then I would say it's love, June 21st, that activates June 22nd, love or the forces of the heart. 
Regulus, June 23rd. So this kind of as a contemplation, it's love that activates the heart of the human being. Beautiful, beautiful contemplation to hold in the chalice pause of this season. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then Lucien is going to take us through an artistic activity and then I will share one more slide after that and then hopefully there will be time for us to have some conversation. Hopefully I didn't go too fast. And if you have questions right now, you can either put them in the chat or just scribble them down so that you don't lose them by the time we get to that point in our, um, in our sharing. Okay, Lucien, I'm going to put my, mute myself unless you need me to jump in and over to you. Thank you, Mary. You're always bringing the inspiration. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so I think that with the, with the way in which art can best serve spiritual scientific research is to encourage people to explore and do their own thing. Um, I'm also aware that sometimes art, embarking on an artistic activity is scary for people if there's too much freedom. Um, so I'm going to give some guidance, but um, I would like us to just first start with um, a feeling for Elizabeth Sophia. If we can think of Elizabeth and Sophia as united um, and just start drawing on our page uh, with the color and the movement of the feeling of Elizabeth Sophia. So we'll just work a few minutes on this, um, on this movement of Elizabeth Sophia. And when you're, when you're working with the color and the gesture and the speed, um, try to tap into your own being, your own body, and feel how what you're drawing on the page is really connecting to your, to your body, to your essence. Let, let the, the artistic activity actually take you deeper into a self-experience of how this um, Elizabeth Sophia is working in you. And don't get caught in the concept of this. Um, it's much more fruitful to let yourself um, freely touch the color on the page and feel how it moves and sense how it's being revealed through that movement. Trust, trust infinitely in your own creative exploration. You can think of Steiner's uh, words about architecture. How do two forms meet? You don't figure out the corner from the corner. You figure out the corner from the way in which forms unite with each other. That might help, um, yeah, bring your, your nuance into harmony, bring the, the, bring the diversity of forms into harmony. And notice how you're feeling in relationship to Sophia in relationship to wisdom. Notice how you are um, 
a bearer or a mother of wisdom. Now, if you don't have color, pencils or pastels, you can um, work with a pen and just focus on form and movement and really imbue these qualities of wisdom um, and mothering wisdom into the gesture and the form. All right, now let us engage with Mary and love. Working with the same intuitive exploration of movement, quality of touch, um, the language of the color itself. How does Mary and love live in this forming wisdom? How is love going to be formed in this wisdom? How is wisdom going to um, inspire this love to find form? And, and the experience of this new color and this new impulse, allow it to arise in your body, in your physical body. It's so beautiful when we can live with color in such an intimate way that our blood and our breath and our heat and our coolness um, and our heart rate actually experiences the artistic event taking place that we are creating to really participate in a fully embodied way with these qualities of love um, and also the colors that we feel can express love. And of course you have to love what you're doing. <laughs> right now in order to draw love. <laughs> so don't be critical of what you're doing. When we love someone, we sometimes feel um, like our larynx is flooded with joy. This is an experience that is related to the mystery of love. How does the larynx transform through the fire of the heart? We can almost think of Mary as the, the Mary of today, um, as the fire that transforms the word the love that gives birth to the true word. And in that way, of course, we touch on John and conscience. So notice how you are allowing the more astral soul impulses of wisdom that are rich, richly moving, flowing, inspiring to kind of collect the love and give that infinite expansion of love some sort of form.
this beautiful image is coming to me right now of when John sort of leaps in Elizabeth's womb um, in relationship to, to the Christ child and Mary. Uh, I'm almost thinking of it as wisdom's form kind of coming into being in relationship to love. How is love actually revealing that wisdom is the former? Not only the, the predecessor, but the sculptor of love. Let's just take one more minute to work with love specifically. Some of you may be, might be noticing right now how um, love is a wholly different quality than wisdom. And we work with love in a very different way than we work with wisdom. It might be more mysterious or less mysterious to some people. Just notice how it is for you. This is like, Art is such an incredible way to learn about these spiritual mysteries because it, it allows us to, to discover processes of creativity that directly express spiritual realities in a very self-explorative way. All right. <clears throat> so we have love and wisdom kind of flowing being on our page. Now, I would like to go to conscience. This becomes a little bit more elusive, maybe. Where can we find the conscience that is living between the love and the wisdom? Love without conscience is potentially luciferic. Wisdom without conscience is potentially harmonic. It's like knowledge and it's, um, it's documenting everything without a warmth. Um, so if you can look on your page and kind of feel into, is conscience living on my page? And is it living between the love and the wisdom in some way? How, how am I experiencing what is conscience between love and wisdom? And when you find it, look for a color that you can start to kind of unravel that element, that third element that brings love and wisdom into um, the human eye. My mom took my, we both, we both thought of the same conscience color. <laughs> so we're struggling over conscience here. <laughs> we'll share conscience for a little bit. Um, now it would be, it would be awesome if what you're experiencing right now with conscience is something unexpected. Uh, if what is, is being revealed as this mysterious in-between of love and wisdom that specifically relates to the human being's consciousness, um, the capacity to um, be an individuality. Um, and what that relates to is to see the other individuality that you can serve. So if this conscience is revealing itself in a sort of spontaneous 
way that has no predetermined awareness or doctrine, then I would say conscience is um, enjoying you right now. So again, what is the difference in the form that conscience wants to express itself through from love and wisdom? How is it different from love and wisdom? Where on the page did it arise? Where in your own being is it activated? What does it feel like? If at any moment you get lost or if you've been lost, touch on the color, unite with the color. The color and the, and the movement through which you draw it will never lead you astray because it is a pure reality. We, we make it complicated. Color is very, like a direct expression of the angels. So you can kind of notice that this page is turning into an organism. It's like a center talks about the Gertianum architecture, all those hand carved wooden forms as organs of the spirit. Well, to me, the reason why he said that is because the impulse through which they're carved out of combined with the wisdom of the form allows for that actual image and that incarnated artistic reality to be a document coming from spiritual inspiration. And we can, we can experience this, our own artwork in that way as an organ of the spirit that we have said yes to creating and it can speak to us in infinite amount of ways with infinite teachings. And you can know from remembering your process that, oh, I made this light, I made this color out of my inquiry into conscience, or I made this out of my inquiry into love in relationship to wisdom. All right, now let's move to the son of Mary. Now we could talk about Christ. <clears throat> as love. Um, Marie Steiner calls um, Christ the ego God. So we could also talk about him as the God of individuality or individuality, um, the, the, the universal individuality. And obviously this, this, um, the, the one who comes after conscience, John, out of wisdom, Elizabeth, is, um, is love. It's an encompassing, it's like now that I 
have been baptized by conscience, I am an individual. I'm a free, self-aware human being. And in the context of Christ, Jesus, this encompasses the whole world. Indiv the principle of individuality basically baptizes the entire world after being baptized by conscience. So how is individuality going to emerge on your page as, as a world baptism, as a baptism of love, wisdom, and conscience. How, how is individuality arising out of the conscience on your page? How is it meeting it as the receiver of a baptism? I know for me right now, I'm experiencing the need to start drawing in a very different way than I was before. Like, with a different texture, a different speed. Um, I'm gonna listen to that. It doesn't, it's not like, why does individuality want to move fast? That's not the type of thought process that, that feels relevant. It's more, um, how does the color want to appear through the intuition of movement? So Lucien, I wonder if you would be willing to show us what is happening for you. Yes. I don't want to. Um, yeah, I, I can totally do that. Convent what anyone else is doing, but I think it might be interesting for us to see. Yeah, that you've been speaking and and creating. So I have my 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 blue wisdom, and I kind of just started um, inviting. Sophia into myself and asking her to guide me. How does, how does wisdom appear in my life? What is the quality? Well, it's kind of, um, it's like air, it's like water, it flows. Um, and it's, it's more blue. <laughs> and then I kind of brought in the love and I allowed for the love to be sort of foiled in the wisdom. And I also experienced in myself uh, an awakening of the heart rather than um, a sort of uh, receptivity of the soul element, which is much more um, cosmic. The love is more inward, personal, but infinite and, and warm. So I kind of worked with that love and the wisdom, not thinking about conceptually what I'm drawing, but just allowing it to be a pure expression of the quality of my experience working with these qualities. And then I saw on my page that in this little space right here, there was conscience spoke to me. It was like this, this delicate space between love and wisdom. And it wanted to ray outward as a sort of hearken or a call, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of like John in the wilderness. Um, and that call rays out in this yellow. And now my impulse to bring the individuality in that kind of circumscribes the whole diagram, the whole organ of the spirit on this page is orange. And I'm going to Experience, I'm going to invite this yellow into my experience. I'm going to invite it into my heart realm, into my heart ether, and allow for a new um, formative impulse to awaken in me. And that impulse for me right now is that orange wants to kind of bubble up around the yellow as like a response to that call. And that orange is going, I'm seeing that it will kind of form a, a circle around this image, collecting it in some stability, in some centeredness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thank thinking that, yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for asking. Yeah, so just, um, I'm 
Mary's talking about how do we um, become festival, fe festival creators? How do we live festivals um, with the cycle of the earth? I find that working with art out of the principles that these festivals are permeated with is one of those ways of engaging with the elements of water or wisdom or love or fire. And we can obviously put, we can also say water is love because it's the ether body, which is the body of love. Um, we can bring a lot of, you know, we can bring a lot of these qualities into um, other terms and other elements depending on their context, but. Yeah, so ideally then it would be to uh, a suggestion for how to use this as, as a way to support creating a festival. Yes. To artistically, to enter into the, the color prior to form and mm -hmm. potentially the feeling before the thought and to have this idea that we're in that point in the cycle of the year where there would be this kind of practice of spirit sensing Exactly. And not hold ourselves to, to form, to intellect, um, but to lived experience. And then also, I personally would go a step further in potentially using an experience of color as a way to um, settle into a, a, a particular mood that then I would be gathering the elements of ceremony. Like for me, it's like the time of the, the equinox, the solstice or the time of the the sunset or sunrise, and then what elements might I bring that belong to an experience of the cycle of the year, particularly since East, since uh, Christmas time, that might reflect um, or might might sim even symbolize something that I experienced mm -hmm. in that time that shows how I have been supported inwardly by these mysteries. Totally. Yeah. 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 So our, our, our intent, everyone, was to kind of have a, to t kind of touch these experiences as a way to suggest not just what we are doing now to be the celebration of Solstice or St. John's, but just to point at a way to enter into a thought about what this is about and then activity that we could do. Exactly. And Mary was talking to me earlier about how, um, or actually with, with everyone, not just me. <laughs> uh, from Christmas until St. John's, we're kind of, um, we're getting everything we need in order to, did you say sacrifice it or give it for the, for, from St. John's? I think the word I used was offer. Offer, yeah. Um, now with, with a drawing like this made <clears throat> in, the, in the inspiration of St. John's Tide, this is something that if you if you enjoy what you made and if you feel like it can if it speaks to you, this is something you can have in your room for the entire year because it actually holds what came before and what what you're working on offering for the remainder of the year. And this is why I was talking about these self-creating organs of perception that we can have in our homes that actually come out of these inspirations. When when you look at your artwork, and you're living with this question of what am I offering at the second half of the year? What you've made is going to express, it's going to ray forth the inspirations that it was made with. And if the inspirations are from St. John's Tide, they will be that sort of crossing point. So in the interest of time, Lucien, I wanna ask if there's anything else that you need to, to share or if we should um, get to the... We should get to it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. For, <laughs> I would love, I mean, for, for the sharing, for people to show what they, is that what you mean? Yeah. To show what well, or just, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a little bit off on the time. In my time zone, it's a quarter to nine. What time is it for you? Um, yeah, so I was thinking that um, if people had questions for you and they kind of brought their artwork with the question or if they didn't want to bring their artwork, it would just be a time okay. to talk, talk with you about everything. Yeah. Do we want to hold up our artwork? Just hold it up and put it on a gallery or something? Uh, we could do that. Just yeah. for a moment, we can just put it on gallery. 
Wow. Amazing. Look at the Wow, color. so much intensity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, thank so beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Yeah, everyone. and thank you, Lucian. Thank you for leading us into that, into, into for what I had this experience of really settling into a mood. And I'm going to, um, I think that the, the last slide that I have to share with us fits really well with what Lucien was saying to us about color. And this again, coming from Marie Steiner from her forward to Eurythmia as Visible Singing. And she is, I think, speaking quite specifically about a verse that Rudolf Steiner gave um, prior to giving her the star spoke once to man verse. There is this verse about Isis Sophia that she has been slain and is cast into the cosmos and that that she is kind of held captive by Lucifer who has washed out her many colors. And that this, the backdrop for this is the experience of being human bereft of the spirit that is kind of the consequence of a way of thinking through the scientific revolution. But that when we start to take hold of our capacity for speaking with the stars, which is supported by a festival life, supported by recognizing What's happening in a feast day? What's happening when an individual crosses the threshold and when we come into artistic and ceremonial contemplation of that, specifically because we know that it's related to earth and sun and stars on a particular day throughout the cycle of the year, that this becomes kind of the, the, arc, the, the spiritual architecture, or you could say the spiritual calendar of the year. And so I think of this as this, this closing statement that she made at the end of this beautiful forward that she wrote, Isis is lifting her veil. She is shining in all the colors of the depths and the heights. Behind her stands the all. The colors form the rainbow bridge onto which those who overcome the force of gravity may step. Past and future light up while the dark present is made to yield. The bridge is the newly won consciousness through which the light is shining in the darkness. Such a brilliant way to, to introduce Eurythmy, to, to give its relationship to the word, and then also to point to the gospel of St. John. So this I'm just sharing as a, a, a contemplation now for the end of, of my slides, and then also to kind of open the space for anyone that might have a question or a comment or something that you would like to share about uh, St. John's, even an idea for a celebration. Well, we have a celebration at Zinnaker's this weekend on the 24th. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We have a big bonfire. Yes, of course. Yeah, so I've uh, read about and tried to do this once, not with a, a wheel, but that you would light a, light a wheel, light it on fire and roll it down a hill as a celebration for the returning of the sun. So what I've done is take a lantern and, and not light it until I get to the top of the hill and then light it and then walk back down <laughs> the hill like I'm walking back down with the sun. It's coming oh, back nice. down yeah, mm -hmm. from the top. I have a question for Lucian. At, okay. at one point, can I just in, ask for um, people to let's let's start the question and answer in a little bit um, more systematic way. So if you do have a question, just please raise your hand with uh, um, the hand, little hand that you can access reactions. to the react in the, under the reactions, and then we'll take your uh, one at a time. And Richard, yes, you can go first, and um, you're asking a question to Lucian. Yeah. So, so thank you, Lucian, oh. and Lucian, for their presentations. So Lucian, at one point in your presentation, you used the phrase universal individuality. And those are not two concepts that I would necessarily put together, uh, at least not peacefully. Yeah. So I'm wondering what you had in mind when you said that. Awesome question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the, to me, it's like the meaning of the world. 
um, when I think of when I think of the Christ in a sort of scientific, a spiritual scientific way, um, and also the development of individuality in relationship to esoteric Christianity, um, we're looking at the development of the individual into a universal being, a being that a being of humanity, a being that is reflecting humanity in the individuality of oneself. It kind of it connects very, very readily to the um, idea of Steiner that in the community the individual should be reflected and the in the um, individual, the community what are what is it? Yeah, you were there. Yeah. So it's a social creed. The healthy yeah. social life is found when in the mirror of each human being, the whole community finds its reflection. And when in the com community, the virtue of each one is living. Yeah, and I think with art specifically, um, art history reveals a lot of um, personality. And we're coming into a time right now with the ethere with the Christ the Christification or the Christianizing of the ether, where art has now an opportunity to become selfless, a spiritual mm. scientific activity. And that needs to be born from the higher eye, when the higher eye is creating and being interested in the artistic process, it allows for in pure intuition to create the artwork rather than um, the personalities of the, of the soul life. So it's kind of, you know, it's very multidimensional what that means, um, what universal individuality means, but you can see that in your artwork, when you're, when you're living into these pure spiritual foundations of love, wisdom, um, conscience or morality, individuality, freedom, this is really where um, the individuality can become the creator of the artwork. And that's much different than the personality because it, it connects to the universal human being, which is the Christ being. And out of these universal inspirations, not only can the individuality develop, but the artwork itself can be an expression of a universal striving. All right, thank you, Lucien. Uh, would anyone else like to ask a question of either Mary or Lucien? Mary, while we're waiting, I have a question for you about, yeah. um, maybe you could talk a little bit about wisdom as crystallized pain. And I was thinking about wisdom, the way that you spoke about wisdom um, and the relationship to water. And I thought of water and ice and uh, Robert Frost has a very short poem. I think it's him about uh, uh, fire and ice. And uh, do you know that poem? I, not by heart, but I do know of it, yes. I mean, it's interesting wisdom and crystallized pain because if, if, the, if the element of wisdom is water, then yes, it can become ice and snow it can it can transform but just as it as, as water um i feel like it's it would be a teacher in that working with pain it be, because it has this um at least if we take from the quote that i shared from theodore schwenk that it totally renounces itself so and also leading on what what lucien just shared that it, it isn't about the personality of it so trying to look at how in our pain, this is, uh, okay, just totally off the cuff. So I haven't, haven't prepared to answer a question like this. So I don't want to offend anybody in saying this, but when I think about something that might be painful in the feeling life, it really does require it of me that I get to a place of contemplating another sometimes. And so there is a certain renunciation of the self, not to repress or deny, but also that out of the pain, if I can think of another, that something transforms in the pain. And I guess since I'm here, I will just share that in my fourth labor with my fourth child, I found myself in the car with my husband in a traffic jam. It was rush hour in the morning. 
And so we were side by side with the cars that were next to us, you know, and sometimes the person in the next car is just a couple feet away from you. And I looked over at the person next to me and I thought to myself, isn't it interesting? He's just going to work. He's probably thinking about how long it's going to take him to get through this traffic. And I'm right next to him having a baby. <laughs> he doesn't know that. And I'm a, the, the contraction was mounting and, you know, contractions can be pretty painful. The thought came to me. When I looked at him, may you have the strength that you most need at the time when it's most needed. And so I say this just as a way of how the pain, as a, as a kind of a, a wish or a prayer for another, it really developed into this remarkable, um, wondrous experience. This was my fourth birth. So I knew what I was in for. But going through this process, and I, I don't want to belabor it too much, but it was really interesting to take the pain and offer it as strength to another who didn't necessarily even know, just through the thinking. So I think of that in relationship to if, if, if water is rightly described as the element of wisdom and water has this quality of total renunciation in order to support all of life, there isn't anything that we would describe as living that can live without water. So it is totally selfless. That, that, that to me is how it can, that, that's how it, the pain relates to, the, or we can work with the pain in that. Sorry. It's interesting, Mary, too, about that fire um, melts ice through warmth and yeah. warmth is, you know, yeah. level rises out of warmth. So yeah, thank you. That's very interesting. All right, Travis, I think you are next. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Lucian. I uh, appreciate it. Mary, you always just, every time I hear you speak, it just fires up inside of me. So what I kept thinking of was, you know, with, and through your talk and with what Lucian said was the old moon, because that was the, the, the planet of water. And that's where wisdom was developed on the old moon. So wisdom preceded love because now we're on earth and that's the purpose of the earth is the planet of love. So, so wisdom preceded love. And when I think of the, the ego, the, the, the Christ individualized ego, for, for me, it's when you, when you recognize that Christ, when you, when you attain to that consciousness of Christ within yourself, then it fires up in everyone you see. Mm -hmm. And so it actually dissolves, it dissolves all differences because no matter what your personality may be, no matter what your, your likes and your dislikes may be, if I can behold within you the Christ, I see me. Mm -hmm. And that is that that is that individual. We're all different, but we're all that body of Christ through our through our differences. And that's really hard. And what I have to be aware of for me, because when I start finding myself in a position of wanting to judge other people, then it's my it's my sympathy and my antipathy. Now, where does that antipathy come from? And that's when I know. Some of those, you know, Luciferic and harmonic forces are trying to weave in and keep me separated from the rest of the world. That's beautiful. You know, so, I, so the question I have is, is also, so at this specific time in the cycle of the year, how do I bring, it does that, can it inform a ceremony that says, I mean to participate this way with humanity, with the earth, with the cosmos, as a human being, as a spiritual scientist, and, and I have these thoughts and these ideas. Now, how, can that help me to create a festival? What, do, what does that yeah. look like? Like I'm thinking tomorrow of, you know, getting up at dawn and, and doing what I would call a, um, I mean, I don't want to diminish the, the sacramental nature of it, but a, a baptism, yeah. you know, to, to, to actually get into the water and to think about this element as mm -hmm. it is an element of wisdom and potentially to have a candle with the flame and to really try to sense how does this belong to this point in the cycle of the year and can it, is it as chaliced? If I don't do it, if I just think about it, you know, it's, it might be an interesting idea, but if I actually do without mm -hmm. thinking, like I'm just gonna do this and then allow it to become, it requires it of us. I think that we have to listen through the entire cycle of the year. And it's not necessarily that an idea will show up, but a moment of inspiration, like a flame, like you're saying, like something will in, ignite in my being that I can't necessarily trace back to having done that ceremony. 
But timing a ceremony to a feast day, to a festival day, to celestial phenomena is saying, I think, to the cosmos, I intend to engage harmoniously in this becoming and not randomly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, oh, thank you Lucy. And a wonderful, wonderful yeah. presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, Leon, it's your turn. You may un. Hi, everyone. Um, Mary, you mentioned you weren't uh, an embryologist. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm a biologist. And uh, a while ago, I came across an anthroposophical site which shows wonderful movies of embryos and of fertilization. And it occurred to me that people might like to look at this. So I put it in the chat. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And uh, it's a, a Dutchman, John yes. and de Waal. Have you come yes, across I'm, I'm familiar with him and with his work, yes. Oh, good, okay. Yeah. I will so, confess that I haven't studied it too deeply. I touched it about 20 years ago, and I have just kind of been in, <laughs> sometimes I can be very dogmatic, and I want, like, don't tell me I want to find my way to that myself and really trying to sense in the cycle of the year, is this an appropriate thought that when we're breathing out, we're conceiving something? Why do you put the feast of the visitation on July 2nd? They weren't even together on July 2nd. They're both pregnant. What is this? How does it mean to suggest, oh, human being, you are bearing something? And if in the analogy that is made to the, the developing embryo, that out of this, the organ, the major organs will begin to form. Is that happening in the cycle of the year? Like this, so I'm coming at it from the calendar rather than from the biology of it. Just trying to sense, can I become aware of that? It's a question I ask. And so for me, trying to do ceremony out of the elements that belong to the time in which I find myself, doing it rhythmically and listening. It's a continual listening and looking back. I do, you know, for me, it's, you know, I go back into my journal. I go back to see what did I do and following when might the, when might the moon meet Venus again? Does something sound into what I did when they were together? It can get really rigid sometimes, but also just to kind of keep it open. St. John's, middle of August, Michaelmas, Christmas. What, what am I, what is my festival life like out of myself? But thank you. His, what, ja, Van der Waal, uh, what was his name? I can't remember that. And it occurred to me that now it's about, I think it's a year since uh, Roe Ro versus Wade was overturned. And many people, you know, felt it was their right to abort. And it wasn't, of course. But also, if, if people saw this kind of image of the wonderful activities and life of the embryo so new, it would, I think, alter a lot of people's perspective because they don't regard it as killing what many pe people do, don't. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's a hot political topic. I pr would prefer yeah. to not go there, but I would just say that I think the fruits of spiritual science, what the fruits of spiritual science can bring to a topic like that is broadening our definition of life and I know that this is part of that discussion is trying to determine when does it begin. And I think that, you know, what we can say is when isn't it? Yeah. Think about the reincarnation of the soul spirit being that there is a different starting point for trying to enter into that mystery of our culture. And, and, and also, yeah, it's not just in our time that this has been an issue. So thank you. And if you said you'd put in the chat his, his site so that folks can look. Thank you for that, Leon. Yeah, okay, then uh, thank you so much, Leon. And now, Jennifer, you may ask your question and please unmute. Thank you. Um, Mary, this may be right off topic for you and please say so if, it's, if that's the case. But I, I live in Australia, Southern Hemisphere, so it's midwinter for us. Yes. And I, first of all, I was wondering where the dates for these festivals come from? Are they just from the Christian calendar? It's, so June the 24th, is that uh, just part of the Christian calendar of feasts and so on? 
mm -hmm. or is there a significance in during the 24th for St. John? So I, what I know is that Rudolf Steiner describes, I think it's in the alphabet lecture, how he's describing the descent of a human being toward incarnation. And he yeah. does say that there is this Christian tradition of naming a child on the, the, according to the saint whose feast day the child is born on, because ideally what's happening, it's not the word ideally, but that when a saint dies, what would be happening is they're carrying something into the spiritual environment of the earth that doesn't diminish. It resounds through the spiritual environment. And, and I would take it so far as to say, it's as though being recorded in the earth relationship to all the way out to the zodiac of stars at that degree. And so that every time the sun is crossing over that degree of zodiac, something lights up out of the deed of that being. And if you call the name of that being on that day, it can strengthen it or activate it. And further, Rudolf Steiner describes that even when early calendar makers were not conscious of it, the placing of a feast day in the calendar was guided by a higher wisdom. Okay, that's, so, that's what I was yeah. wondering. Yeah. And so the St. John's, you know, this is this is Northern Hemisphere because it does yeah. have to do with the, the, the full out breath. And I think this is a great mystery. How do we attain the wisdom of the earth that can be both awake and asleep yes. in breathing and out breathing? Yes. And I don't know that we don't have that earth wisdom in ourselves yet. And it seems to me that it's reliant on our getting to a place of love to allow that contradiction to exist and then to begin to understand. Um, so thank, right. thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Because down here, it's very hard to sort of, uh, you know, like at Christmas time, for us, it's midsummer. Yes. And yet it's yes. also Christmas. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, I experienced both of those things and you know obviously now it's we have our midwinter festivals for most of the Waldorf schools and so on um, so we have a bonfire and all of that sort of thing and the lanterns you know going into the spiral yes but uh, I can't experience that in midsummer you know Christmas time it's not a Christmas experience for me so, you know, we well, I have a, you know, feeling that we've got a bit of work to do to, to know how to work uh, with these things, certainly in the Southern Hemisphere. But I think it's also a question for the whole Earth. How do we, how do we, how are we conscious of what is happening? You know, because here we're quite conscious of what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> Yeah, I, would, uh, I, I think it's, some, it's a question I have contemplated for quite a while. I've never arrived at what is the solution. I was for a while working with a gal in the Southern Hemisphere, trying to study the festivals together yeah. so that we could arrive at a sense of the, the mood. Because I, I don't, I don't. The question I have is, is it appropriate? I don't think it's appropriate to say, well, you're in your midwinter, so you should be doing Christmas right now. No. I think it's the, it's the inner gesture, like you're holding the, the inner space while we're breathed out. And, and I right. want to say, thank you for doing that so we don't go off earth. <laughs> you know, and then we do that, and then we do the opposite. You know, so I wonder if it's that you are having an inner St. John while we're having an outer St. John. Yeah. And you're having an outer Christ birth while we're having an inner. That's right. You know, that's, maybe that's yeah. the way. To yeah. work it, is that what is what is John within? Yeah. What is, the, what is Christmas without? Yeah. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, Thanks thank very you. much. Thanks for joining and for tolerating my. Northern Hemisphere bias. <laughs> oh, thank you for thank you for all that you bring. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. That was lovely. And now we are looking at um, Patricia. It is um, your turn to unmute and speak and ask your question. Thank you. She's not unmuted. Uh, yeah. So you, Patricia, you can unmute her. Patricia, can you unmute? There, is that it? Yes. There you go. Thank you both, thank you. Um, speaking of the embryo, I was at the senses really 
uh, listening to a talk by Ellen Lubin uh, mm. at one time that the sense of hearing is the last to leave and the first to come in, but possibly never leave. I think it has to do with a just distance mm. because mm. we can always call a spirit in, mm. I think. Um, and then the other thing that came was that out of, from a book by Rudolf Steiner on Lucifer and Araman, I'm sorry, I don't remember just where, but it's the larynx that is the only free real estate. <laughs> that, you know, the, the metabolic system, you know, each have their, their, you know, we'll take this part, you take that part, mm -hmm. but this one is free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to speak. And so I was wondering, um, while I'm in Lake Tahoe tomorrow morning, very early, maybe I'll meet Rose there. She said she'd be possibly going there. What shall we speak? What verse? Uh -huh. what? Uh -huh. mm. Yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm not hearing you ask me specifically to give you a verse, but I would <laughs> like to reflect on something that I'm remembering that, Rudolf, that I read in Rudolf Steiner, that with the heart, through the organ of the heart, we make ourselves human. But through the organ of the larynx, the cosmos makes us human. And our capacity for speaking is a gift from the gods. And that when we are at this time of the summer solstice, which can be likened to being in the dream, that Rudolf Steiner also describes in the evolution of consciousness lectures that were given in August at the summer school in um, Great Britain in 1923, that a dream can be understood rightly as the utterance of the gods. So there's something about this quality of the speaking of the gods, our capacity to speak as a gift from the gods, our being in this, this, this dream-like state, and how does it belong to our, our becoming? I almost feel that, okay, now I'm, I'm bumping into an answer to the question you maybe weren't asking for, of me, that in 1922, at Christmas when Rudolf Steiner gave to Marie Steiner, the stars spoke once to man verse. There's a description there of how we're no longer hearing it. So the sense of hearing, and now we must speak it. And then one week later, the first Gertianum was consumed by fire. One year later, he spoke the foundation stone meditation. So I think of this foundation stone meditation as a demonstration of how one speaks to the stars. And that it's the, the potential for bringing the word to a ceremonial celebration at this time of year, that that would be a place to begin potentially. Speaking the foundation stone meditation warmed through with the heart, you could say the flame of love and it is the element of the word. And I had also one of the paths I was going to go down tonight that I didn't included looking at what Dante does with this, where he has at the seventh cornice of the purgatory, Dante has to pass through a wall of fire. So there's something about this mystery of passing through spiritual fire, which you could say in the spirit, in the, in the, the movement of anthroposophy and its history, we've all just come through potentially this 100 year rhythm of encounter with spiritual fire. And that the next thing that happens, not, you know, the, of many things, is that then Dante has his, his head is dunked by Matilda into the river of forgetfulness. And then he meets his Beatrice, and then he's given the draft of good remembrance. And so if you relate this to what Rudolf Steiner says in chapter three of Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, where he's describing the different trials. There's the fire trial, but then after you've gone through the, the uh, water trial and the air trial, then you're given the draft of forgetfulness, which is an overcoming of the lower mind. And those things that would bind us in a, a certain kind of 
judgment about what our activity to release that and then you're given a draft of remembrance. And so I feel like these two things also belong to this mystery of fire and water at this time of year. And so how is a baptism potentially um, initially a, a into the waters of forgetfulness and in that capacity to speak, which is the, the word is uses as its element, the fire, that then I can come to a baptism by the waters of good remembrance. And I think that the foundation stone meditation speaks right to that. No, this is um, wonderful. Yes. Thank we you. started uh, reading, um, may human beings hear it, Prokofiev. Uh -huh. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Just the introduction is what we went through last night and it's speaking to all of these things. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So it wouldn't be, wouldn't it be great to think of all of us, you know, doing a baptism and reciting the foundation still meditation tomorrow morning as the sun is rising around the world, northern and southern hemisphere. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Good. thank you. Thank you. So lovely. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. the question and for your answer, Mary. Um, I think we may have time for one more question. If anyone has anything mm -hmm. that they want to ask that they have not asked yet. Um, give you like a minute to have your final opportunity. You know, Mary, I guess I would just share in that, that I am going to be up at sunrise tomorrow and I'm going because I live in Harbor Springs, which is on the shores of Lake Michigan where we have natural springs. Um, I'm meeting a friend, an anthroposophical friend, and we are going to do a water ceremony with candles. I have some water that I, that I, it was a, it's actually melted snow that I gathered on the Feast of Annunciation. So one quarter of a year of, a, of the year ago on March 25th, a beautiful snowfall. So I gathered up the snow, it melted. And it was, in, it was important to me to gather it. I was in the right environment for doing it because the Feast of Annunciation is nine months ahead of Christmas. And this year at Christmas, we come to the 100th anniversary of the Christmas conference. So I am continually thinking into the cycle of the year. There may be an element here that I can use later that connects me to this being of the year that Rudolf Steiner describes. And I, well, he doesn't really describe the being of the year. He says that we should unite with the being of the year and become festival creating to do the esoteric. And so I'm always trying to pay attention to what elements of the experience that I'm having where I am on the earth that lend, that lend themselves to becoming festival creating maybe at a different time in the cycle of the year. So trying to think in the whole cycle of the year in, the, in my environment where I get this really um, pretty specific demonstration of the different seasons and then watching what's happening in the star picture and listening also because I'm not near a Christian community, I'm not near a Waldorf community, so I'm having to make it up out of, out of myself. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. You know, you've made me um, inspired to uh, tell you all the uh, just a tiny birth story about my dear son, Lucien, who is born on St. John's Day. Uh -huh. uh, so we will be celebrating his birthday in a few more days. And when I was in labor with him, he was born at 432 in the morning. And when I was in labor with him, all of a sudden we had the most unbelievable storm. It was this rainstorm uh, um, in the middle of the night with all of this lightning. So it was this combination of this crazy lightning and all this rain. And then he finally came out at nine pounds, four ounces. <laughs> he was a, a big Whoa. baby and he was well, my Congratulations, Mary. <laughs> yeah, so uh, anyway, I was, uh, Happy to have him, and uh, you know he gave gave me a little smile, and uh, when he was born, so I thought I think he was happy to be here. So yeah. I'm certainly <laughs> happy to have him here with us tonight. <laughs> and thank I'm you, Lucian, for taking up the work and, and being yeah. <laughs> allowing for me to not give you any direction whatsoever. Yeah, from your heart uh, with your gift. Thank you. 
Oh, yeah. Is, oh, so honored to be Mary. Thank you. Right. So this has been really wonderful and such a great uh, partnership here on all fronts. And so I really want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. I hope you will find something to do um, to celebrate uh, your feast of St. John this year and really um, make it a to be festival creating opportunity and really think about this, carrying it forth through the cycle of the year. Um, so I look forward, Mary, for us to do, continue to have some collaborations and any kind of contributions that anyone can make to uh, um, help us out here in terms of continuing to offer these kind of events would be really appreciated. And um, we're gonna share whatever is, is uh, donated to um, both branches and further our relationship and our collaboration together. So yeah. thank you everyone for being with us yeah. and I hope you have a lovely solstice and a lovely mm -hmm. John and we'll see you next Beautiful time. Beautiful out breath, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And also Mary, it was recorded, right? So the recording will be made available. Yes, and um, yeah, thank you for asking. We are recording it. I will end the recording. And then um, my colleague Andre, on again, who is uh, in charge of our programming, he will end up um, launching it on our website, www.rschicago.org. And Mary, if there's a way to put it on your website too, we can share. I'll do that as well. Yeah. Thank you for taking the helm tonight. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to stop recording and everyone Thank can so much. and say hello to each other. <laughs>